What is going on everybody? Welcome back to The Haunted Beard. My name is Jake and I am now in the midst of reviewing the entire Scream franchise. Today I'm going to be talking about, there it is, Scream 2. But before we get into that, hey, if this is something that you're interested in, you like videos like this, this is what I do on The Haunted Beard. It's all horror and thriller movie talk. So if you're interested in videos like this, please do me a favor and hit that red subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. Now let's get into the movie. Scream 2 came out the following year in 1997, was also directed by Wes Craven. However, according to the film timeline, it actually takes place two years following the events of Scream. This finds Sidney Prescott now in college, kind of getting acclimated to college life when a new killer dons the ghost face mask and begins a brand new string of killings. If I could just put my overall thoughts on this film real succinctly, I would just say it's good, I enjoy it, but it just doesn't quite reach the level of the original. One of the main things that I think this film is is lacking and, and kind of struggles from a little bit is just the lack of humor and comedy that I felt was so abundant in the first film. Now, I oftentimes, as I'm critiquing films and thinking about movies, there's kind of this question that arrives sometimes is, do you critique the film for what it is or for what it isn't? And in this case, uh, this isn't a comedy film in the way that the first film is. At least to me, it didn't seem like they necessarily attempted comedy in the same way that the first film did. And so to say that this film isn't good because of something that it didn't really intend to do may not be necessarily a fair criticism. However, when you're dealing with franchises and series of movies like this, obviously everybody's going to compare whatever sequel, you know, however many of them you make, to that original film. And when you make that original film, that is your opportunity to establish the tone and the style of, of what everybody is going to look for in this series. And so for there to be, I think, a significantly you know, less amount of comedy and humor in this, I think it just takes something away from just the laughter and humor that I got out of the first film. And so at the end, it, it just felt a little bit lacking. It just, it doesn't quite give you that tone. It doesn't quite hit you with that aspect. And, and that for me was just, it, it's a little bit of a disappointment. The other aspect I think it also kind of misses out on and falls a little bit short on are the characters. Now, the characters that return from the original film are, are great, and I think they are great in this as well, but the new characters they introduce don't quite have just sort of those character quirks. They don't have as much of a fleshed out personality and sort of individual identities they just don't kind of shine and stick out as much as the characters in the first film. They're a little bit more forgettable and less developed. And so, again, they're they're not bad, but when you're comparing this to something like the first film, in the first film sets the bar so high, it's just it just doesn't quite hit. And so, these aren't necessarily me saying that they're they're bad aspects. It's just this film Again, my overall point was to say this film, it's good, but it just doesn't quite hit those highs as the first film does. Now, to sit here and just continually compare this to the first film is maybe not really fair. And again, when you have what I consider to be an all-time horror classic with the first film, you know, to, to have your expectations set that this film is going to meet that or exceed it, I think is a little unrealistic. Uh, and so I'm going to try to avoid doing that throughout the entire review. And so I, I want to talk about the opening scene. Now, of course, again, this film's opening scene doesn't hit the heights of the first film. But if you kind of disregard that and, and just sort of consider this as a standalone, it's a pretty solid opening scene. You've got uh, Jada Pinkett and Omar Epps as a couple getting ready to go into the movie theater because... We've just added kind of a new meta element to this. They are now going to see Stab, right, which is the movie within the movie, the movie about the events of the first screen film. And, of course, everybody there, well, almost everybody there is, is donning a ghost face killer mask. And I just really like the idea here. I like the, the movie within the movie idea. I think it's, it's 
pretty fresh and original, at least considering this movie is over 20 years old. But I think just that idea still holds up today. I really like that concept. I like the execution of it. The, the build up to the kill doesn't quite have as much of a kind of suspense build. And, and so it, it kind of is lacking a little bit in that. But the actual execution of, of this kill I think is, is pretty great as obviously the real ghost face killer is hiding amongst the crowd. By the way, this has got to be one of the most insane, outrageous, and rambunctious movie theater crowds I think I've ever seen. These people in this scene are out of their minds. But anyways, um, just a great idea with having the actual ghost face killer in the the theater itself hiding amongst all the other you know movie fans and so i i do enjoy the opening scene of this film i think it's pretty solid obviously this film continues the whole kind of meta aspect of it which i really love it continues that whole trend of if you're a horror film fan this is just a continuation of movies for horror movie fans right and so you've got that meta aspect i really like the scene where Randy's in film theory class and they're discussing, you know, which sequels are better than the originals. And, you know, he starts going off on the, the rules about the sequel. Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real life sequel? Stat who? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. Hey, no, oh, wow. Come on, man. Oh, please, please. By definition alone, they're inferior films. It's bullshit generalization. Many sequels have surpassed their original. Oh, yeah? Name one. And I, again, as a movie lover, I, you just can't help but love that stuff. And so that whole aspect is, is a plenty in this movie. I really like it. And I, I pretty much like everything that they do with all that. Any of the sort of just the Easter eggs and the candy for movie lovers, horror film fans, I just eat it right up. I can't help it. It just, it speaks right to me. I'm the target audience for that kind of stuff. And so I just love it. I like the decision that they made with Gale and Dewey in this. I think it just kind of provides a bit of a change and an interesting dynamic change. As Gale has some choice words and criticisms of Dewey that she writes in her book, and Dewey's all upset about it. And so they kind of start off the, the first huge chunk of the film sort of as enemies. They don't like each other, and they're not getting along very well. However, because of that decision, I think that also kind of contributes to some of the, the the lack of humor in the film. You know, Dewey's one of the funnier guys, but he's he's a little bit more serious in this. His sort of lovable charm, at least in his sort of flirtatiousness with Gale, we kind of miss out on a little bit. Now, I got to talk about the character of Randy because, again, being a horror film fan, I love the character of Randy, and I just hate that they killed him off in this film. It bums me out. I wish they didn't. And I, I feel like he deserves such a better death, right? Like, this is the guy who you have such a clear, again, meta aspect to this film. And that's all on him. He's the one, he knows more about horror movies than anybody else. And he kind of really sort of helps kind of drive that aspect of the story and of the narrative. And to kind of shortchange him on the kill that he got where he's really just killed off screen. He gets pulled into the van and then stabbed and you don't even really see it. I just felt like, man, for this guy to go out that way is just, uh, it's a bummer. I wish that, I hate that they kill him, but if they were going to kill him, I wish that they would have gave him some sort of just, I don't know, truly epic sort of horror homage type death that would have just really suited his character better. So uh, there's a bit of a bitter taste in my mouth when, when Randy gets killed off. I want to talk about a few sequences, though, that I really like and think work quite well. One of the first deaths is when Sarah Michelle Gellar's character gets killed off. Uh, I think this is a pretty solid scene. Uh, I, I quite enjoy it. it. It is kind of reminiscent of Drew Barrymore's scene in the original, so I like that aspect of it. I really like the scene later on in the film where Sydney is at her dress rehearsal for the, the, the theater play that she's involved in, and, and Ghostface makes an appearance as one of the uh, characters in the play and, and attacks her during the, the rehearsal and the performance of it. I just thought it was kind of a cool, unique way to sort of add this kind of over-the-top, exaggerated, theatrical aspect to it. The editing here is just works pretty well. It's just kind of really disorienting and chaotic. And I thought that that was kind of a nice touch 
and just a cool scene just from a sort of a stylistic and visual standpoint. I think the scene towards the end of the film where Gale and Dewey kind of finally make up, I guess, and get back together, uh, that whole sequence works pretty well for me where I, I like a little bit of the kind of the sound audio effect-ish that they use where Gail goes into the, I think, the recording studio and, and she can't hear what's going on and then she turns around and there's Dewey getting stabbed and everything and that whole sequence works pretty well. I, I like even earlier on in that sequence where they're watching some of the video footage and then it cuts to and they see the back of their heads and they get the realization that Ghostface is filming them right then. That's kind of a cool little reveal there. Now the best sequence in the film for me in terms of just overall suspenseful tension is the scene where Sidney Prescott and her roommate are in the car trying to leave town and Ghostface attacks and kills the two police officers that are escorting her away and they get trapped in the back, they get in a car wreck, and Ghostface is knocked out unconscious, and they have to crawl out through the back seat onto the front and literally crawl over Ghostface to get out of the car. That one, you really get to kind of savor the tensity of the moment, and just, I think it, it works really well. It's It just kind of has a slower pace. Everything kind of moves slow, because they're not trying to make any sudden movements, and they're trying to be quiet, and you really kind of get to savor the intensity of that moment. I think that sequence is probably the best in the entire movie. Now let's talk about the end where we get the final reveal of who the killers are. There's a few things I want to say. First, I thought the choice of Timothy Oliphant's character is is a pretty good choice. I, I kind of thought that the aspect of them having a bit of a sort of a commentary on, you know, violence in the media and do, you know, do movies make murders and stuff like that was kind of interesting. There's a little bit of a conversation starter there and they kind of run with that aspect and that's sort of his kind of motivation. He's the crazed documentarian film student who's just going to blame all his actions on the movies and not take responsibility for himself. And then the other reveal of the killer being Billy Loomis's mother it makes sense, and I, I understand it. It, it, it would make sense because she would definitely have the, the motivation. The, the one aspect of it, though, that is, uh, it doesn't quite come together for me is that she is a character who pretends to be a journalist, and she is you know shown a handful of times throughout the film, has a handful of interactions with Gail Weathers, and I just find it a little hard to believe that with her being around the college campus so much that Sydney wouldn't see her. They wouldn't have, a, you know, a bump into moment. They wouldn't meet each other. Sydney wouldn't recognize her. Like how somehow she's, she's always there because there's murders happening and she's always trying to get the scoop as a reporter and talking to Gail and like Sydney never sees her and recognizes her. So there's a little bit of an issue there, but uh, her character, it makes sense, and so I, I like it to some degree. In some aspects, I don't like it. And then finally, I want to talk about Cotton Weary's character because I wish that they would have handled him differently and a little bit better than they do. Because they kind of turn him into a little bit of the hero at the end because he ultimately saves Sydney. But our previous interactions with him earlier in the film he's not a very good person. At least they don't really portray him that way. The film doesn't portray him that way. And specifically his scene in, with Sydney in the library where he's trying to convince her to do all these, you know, news stories and interviews and stuff like that. He just comes across as not a good guy and sort of kind of creepy and borderline assaultive and you just don't get good vibes at all from his character. You don't really like him. And this is supposed to be someone that it would seem we're supposed to be a little sympathetic towards because he was falsely accused of killing Sidney's mom. And then they turn him into this total creep, but then he is tr supposedly kind of redeems himself at the end by, you know, killing Billy Loomis's mom and saving Sydney, and so I just, I wish that there was a better way that they handled his character, and uh, so that was, that was a bit of a dis disappointment for me. Overall, though, I, I do enjoy this film. It's a good film. Obviously, it doesn't reach the heights of that original. Everything is, is good, 
but it just doesn't quite hit those levels. So you've still got good stuff with the characters of Sydney, Gail, Dewey, Randy. You've got a good mystery there, a whodunit. You do have some good suspenseful and kill scenes. So it's a good film. I enjoy it. Overall, my grade for this is probably going to be like a six to six and a half. So I do have my issues with it. Again, it doesn't hit the levels of the first film, but it's it's a fun and entertaining enough time. So those are my thoughts on Scream 2. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Let me know down in the comments, though, what your thoughts are on Scream 2. Do you like this movie? How does it compare to the original for you? Did you find any humor in it? Because I really didn't find any at all. And uh, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for watching. And obviously next up is Scream 3. So we will see you next time on The Haunted Beard.